This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And today on Bewilder Beasts, it's all kitties. Like the one time the CIA tried and failed to use a cat as a spy. Some cats need hypoallergenic humans, and did you know there are islands of just cats? I know. Let's go. Y'all asked for it. This is the All Cat Special. And we are 25 weeks into this crazy podcast. You emailed, you let me know that you just wanted cats, and you all are getting cats. So first, a person who loved cats is called an ilurophile, which is Greek for cat lady, or as my friend Dave has embraced, crazy cat gentleman. This episode goes a bit long, but if cats have nine lives, then this episode covers all of them. So before we dive in, remember, please rate and review, subscribe and tell a friend. And if you leave an iTunes review by March 15th, 2021, three of those reviews will be chosen randomly for either your choice of a story or a shout out on the show or a Bewilderby sticker whenever I get them made up. Now that that's out of the way, for Zoe, for Dave, for Kara, for Aislinn, for Janet, and for all the other kitty aficionados out there, let's get on with the show. All right, so as a dog trainer, I hear the phrase hypoallergenic a lot. And often owners will get hypoallergenic animals in the hopes of keeping allergens at bay to prevent symptoms in human caretakers like itchy, watery eyes, coughing, sneezing, facial pressure or pain, skin rash, under eye swelling that appears blue, difficulty breathing, congestion, chest tightness, hives, and in very rare cases, anaphylaxis. You know, that life-threatening thing that, like, according to the Mayo Clinic, anaphylaxis causes your immune system to release a flood of chemicals that can cause you to go into shock. Your blood pressure drops suddenly and your airways narrow, blocking breathing. Signs and symptoms include rapid weak pulse, a skin rash, nausea, and vomiting. Common triggers include certain foods, medications, insect venom, and latex. Allergies to pets are the second largest cause of allergies in the United Kingdom, and half of asthmatic children in the UK are allergic to cats and 40% are allergic to dogs. So as a result of not just wanting to pop extra Claritin or Zyrtex just to keep a beloved pet, some owners might seek out a hypoallergenic pet or one that doesn't trigger allergies. But all pets with fur and feathers can trigger allergies in humans. And the reason pets can still make people cough, wheeze, and sneeze is that we are not necessarily allergic to the fur. We are allergic to the things they bring in on the fur, like mold, dust, pollen, and the very proteins in the animal itself, like proteins found in cats or dogs' spit and urine, and those things can absolutely trigger allergies in humans. So hairless dogs and cats, no matter how you feel about them, I think they're cute, they can still cause you to break out into hives. But while we seek out hypoallergenic cats, dogs, and other animals, have you stopped to think that your pet might also be allergic to you? I know, right? So just like people, 
pets can also show allergic symptoms and can be allergic to humans. Although rarely life-threatening, allergies in pets can cause discomfort in the animal and distress. So next time that you see your cat perusing the internet, just think, he or she may be looking to replace you with a hypoallergenic human. Allergies made me think of one myth that has lasted all through history. How often do you see images of a cat drinking a bowl of milk? Well, most cats are lactose intolerant. And while most will absolutely lap up what you lay down, they will feel crampy and not well following their drink. They may even vomit or have diarrhea, which is, you know, just less pleasant. Worth it. But if your cat is a mammal, how is it that they can drink as babies and not later? Well, milk sugar is called lactose, and it's a very valuable source of energy for baby mammals like kittens, cows, puppies, and yes, humans. However, soon after they are weaned, the enzyme lactase begins to disappear from the gut. And when an adult, like a cat, drinks milk, usually cow milk or goat milk, I mean, unless you have a side hustle as a cat milking specialist, which I do not advise, can you imagine trying to milk a cat? The lactase is the weapon needed, and it's gone. So as a result of lactose just chilling there in the gut with nowhere to go, it might start to ferment, and that's what causes stomach upset and probably a whole lot of cleanup. But if the lactose is not broken down, the typical symptoms of bloating, cramping, diarrhea, and gas can occur, which no one wants that after a double scoop of haagen but it is actually a genetic variant that allows some adult humans to continue to produce lactase, that enzyme, that magic bullet that allows us to drink milk. And humans suffer from lactose intolerance too. And while in old timey times it was considered a disorder if an adult human felt sick after eating dairy, it turns out it's really common to be lactose intolerant. It's actually more common in certain populations of people to be lactose intolerant than to be able to consume milk, cheese, ice cream, etc. without, mm, let's just say, consequences. People of African or Mediterranean descent are way more likely to suffer from lactose intolerance than, say, people from Sweden. And the theory is that after hunter-gatherers started to hunter and gather and started keeping flocks of things like sheep and goats and buffalo and other milk-producing creatures, we could then do things with that milk. And we started selecting for genetic mutations that allowed humans to consume milk without consequences in areas where food might be more scarce. like. My guess is Sweden doesn't really have fruit trees that produce through December. They're not exactly known for their orange groves. Meatballs? Yes. But that's not a fruit, nor do they grow on trees. But if these humans could drink milk or eat cheese, they could hold on to calories and survive the winter. And in warmer climates, where fishing can occur year-round, food on trees is more available, gardening can occur year-round, the need for milk as a primary calorie source is just not necessary. So how fast did this evolution happen? Well, 95% of Neolithic DNA samples from Sweden were lactose intolerant. Compare that to the Swedish population today. Only 25% of individuals suffer from lactose intolerance. This evolution happened over 5,000 years. But to change human DNA, as there are four variables to the genes that tweak lactase things, this is a very short period of time to change what foods humans can consume and digest. So, if you have a friend who loves ice cream but cannot eat it, just promise me you're not going to be that guy and tease him. Instead, have a dairy-free snack with them, and after they leave, that's when you take out the full pint of haagen to your room and you eat to your heart's content. Cats are known as obligate carnivores, too, meaning that they need meat very much like Ron Swanson from Parks and Recreation, and everyone who has ever spoken to me about growing up in Maine when I said I was making the switch to hummus over haggis. Lots of people assume that humans have to have meat, but that is absolutely not true, unlike our cat friends. Cats need to eat meat, and they need much more protein than many other animals, like dogs. 
and it would be like putting vegetable oil in your diesel engine car without converting the necessary parts first. So while I don't think your cat would explode on a vegetarian diet, they will certainly not thrive and will very likely get sick and without adequate nutrition for a cat, he or she could die. So don't do that. And if you are a vegetarian and really, really, really need your pet to be a vegan too, consider guinea pigs. They are incredibly trainable, they're super adorable, and there are tons of YouTube videos of them doing at-home ninja warrior courses. Rabbits also qualify as vegan, but... They're not really a good starter pet. They require a ton of care, including vet visits to make sure their teeth, which continue to grow through their lifetimes, don't grow wonky or become problematic. Oh, and tortoises! I mean, they might need to be willed to your grandchildren, but they're chill and they love the sun and they eat veggies. It's basically a vegan cat with a shell and not as fluffy. I mean, it's not like a cat at all, but you get the idea. The foremost agency in all things spy and intelligence, the CIA, did maybe the dumbest thing in spying. They tried to turn a cat into a spy. And the dumb part wasn't that they wanted to use a cat as a spy. That was actually not a terrible idea. The dumb part was how they did it. You see, cats who live outside cities just generally walk around and nobody pays them any attention, very much like the pigeons. Or if they are given attention, they're just part of the background. Well, the idea was to use these feral cat colonies around the Kremlin, where the president of Russia lives, and near Russian embassies around the world as cover, and to introduce a few spy kitties to hang around in known public spaces where intelligence could be gathered. <laughs> Listening to people with information with a capital I, being all sneaky and stuff, and no one would notice a cat. At least, that was the idea. But this is where the CIA got into the weeds. Instead of just training a cat to drop a small recorder or, I don't know, something, they got a little extra. The CIA decided to make a Franken kitty by taking five years and up to $20 million in funding to insert wire antennas into cat tails, a transmitter into the base of a cat's skull, a microphone surgically implanted into a cat's ear, which they did. And to be fair, computers and devices in the 60s were way bigger then. So if you don't believe me, the first cell phones were the size of a toaster oven and they didn't even have the internet. Your arms would be exhausted after just ordering takeout pizza on the phone. Proto cell phones? Just called people. I know, it's terrible. When I say computers were the size of rooms, like rooms of a house with lots of heat and energy and sounds, I am not being hyperbolic. This would have had to be one heckin' big cat. Maybe a tiger could have been used, but then that would have been more conspicuous. Here, kitty, kitty. As testing continued on living cats and replica dummies, they finally created their meowster piece a real-life spy cat that they called Acoustic Kitty. And immediately, they ran into problems. The same problem most dog people have when they decide to get a cat, because, you know, a cat, it's just a small dog. It's not. A small dog is a small dog. A cat is a constant test of Newton's first law of motion. An object, like a glass on a table, will stay at rest until a force, like a jerk cat, knocks it over. Cats have a reputation for doing their own thing, being more independent, less interest in what people want. What this kitty wanted was more food, so the cat would just wander off mid-session. Eventually, the CIA decided it was go time. They released the cat out of the van, again, super sneakily parked on a corner in a city. No one would look at that, right? I mean, it was the 60s, so it probably had free candy printed on the side of it to blend in. As soon as the cat was released for its very first mission, a mission that netted the CIA $20 million over five years in training, experimentation, equipment, surgeries, and more, the cat was immediately hit by a taxi. And 
with the death of Acoustic Kitty, the project was instantly scrapped. The CIA said that they scrapped this project because it just took too long to train the cats and because they wouldn't behave. This was the 1960s, so I'm going to guess that there were more men in charge and not the stereotypical cat ladies at the helm who would have absolutely been able to advocate more for the kitties in one important way that likely would have changed the entire program. The assumption even today, but I can only imagine was way more potent in the 60s, is that cats are not trainable. But as you've seen on this podcast, or if you're a kiddo who watched my talks over the summer, you know humans can. Train a fish to play soccer, a horse to accept a rider doing gymnastics on his or her back. A guinea pig to run an agility course, dogs to find COVID, whale poop, and malaria, caterpillars to target to a specific color. So after they turn to goo, metamorphosize into butterflies and come out for a very short window of life thereafter, they remember their reinforced color and will go to it. Side note, which to me makes me realize that they remember turning into goo and reshaping their bodies, which is a lot. And ugh, ugh. anyway, Cows to accept painting eyeballs on their booties, pigs to play the piano and wear a captain's hat, tigers to give their tails for blood draws, hawks and falcons to come when called, chickens to run an agility course with just a clicker and corn, a horse to do math, rats to find unexploded devices, and bees to find bombs. Yes, you can absolutely train a cat to be a spy. You just have to know how to do it. You have to know what it is that you want so you can train it. And I think that was maybe the problem. See, the problem wasn't that the cat wasn't able to be trained. The problem was the CIA, an intelligence organization that did not have the skills to train such an animal to do a task, a very specific task. And that is a very specific set of skills. Heck, I have trained a 13-year-old cat with arthritis, how to stay, leave it, target to my hand, spin, sit, and more. And that was a cat who had no prior training who happens to live in my house. But I was bored over the summer, and with COVID restrictions and as a dog trainer, I wanted a challenge, and I got it. It turns out that training cats isn't really that challenging at all if you know how learning works. And if you happen to know the smallest bit of what motivates a cat. Tuna and catnip happened to work wonders. The CIA didn't. And that's not to disparage the CIA. And I'm saying that because in case they're listening, I want to make sure I can still produce episodes. But unlike Liam Neeson and Taken, I do not have a particular set of skills when it comes to finding and bringing back kidnap victims or figuring out insurance fraud or any number of things that the CIA does when they meet casually on park benches with surreptitious manila envelopes. But I can get a cat to sit and stay for several minutes on top of a refrigerator while I make sandwiches, and the cue for her to do that is not for me to say a single word. It's the door to the refrigerator opening. It did take some time, and it took a lot of reinforcement, but after a year, I have a cat who will not bother me while I'm using the counter space. So while this kitty died for his or her country, we now know that we can use animals. Famous animal trainer Bob Bailey worked for the CIA as the first director of training for the Navy's pioneering dolphin program. And he frequently speaks at conferences for dog trainers like me about how he can train any animal using learning theory. He has never found an animal he cannot train. My favorite example of this comes from a Smithsonian article. Bob Bailey was teaching a course for Susan Garrett. She's an agility dog instructor, and she's really fun. He happened to have a laser pointer on him because that's a tool that he uses while he teaches. Nothing weird so far, right? Well, one day he was in the bathroom and he saw a spider, and he took out his laser, and he turned it on, and he blew on the spider. As wind blows down spider webs, they dislike wind, and the spider will instinctively curl up into a tiny ball for protection. So using what he had, a laser pointer, instinct, and knowledge of how animals learn, he decided he was going to train a spider. Turn on the laser, blow. Turn on the laser, blow. The order is important. You want the laser to predict the blow is coming. You can do this with a friend. Snap your finger and gently in their eye. Snap, 
snap. Eventually, your snap will make your friend blink before you get a chance to blow. Wait, now that I'm thinking about it, you know what? Wait until you're fully vaccinated from COVID before trying this experiment. You could instead just do what Pavlov did. Ring a bell, give your friend an M&M. After a few rapid successions, you'll see that your friend will turn towards you expecting food when you ring your bell. So Bob Bailey did this at several intervals during the day, which either means he had a very fibrous breakfast or he was taking hydration quite seriously during his training sessions at Susan Garrett's house. Bob Bailey said at the end of the day, all he had to do was flash the laser pointer and the spider would curl into a ball. He walked into a classroom announcing to Susan that she now had a trained spider in her bathroom. To which I say, awesome, I'm glad he can use Pavlovian techniques on a spider. But I can only imagine what the class thought on the other side of the bathroom door before flush, wash, and come out saying, the spider is trained. I'm going to start using that every time I have a very fibrous breakfast and emerge victorious from the bathroom. The spider is trained. Bob Bailey also said that while he cannot talk about it because, you know, CIA, he did get to say, yeah, we got ravens into places, we got the cats into places. They were able to get birds to drop small transmitters on ledges outside of rooms and cats into rooms for the purposes of spying, all before technology improved to where it is today. Bailey said that all they have to do now is use a laser and focus it on a person that they want to hear, and they can read the scatter back, getting a perfect transcript. Or, you know, maybe they're using that laser pointer to get cats to chase the laser into tackling a bad guy. (laughs) Technology has honestly just moved faster than using animals in a practical way for spying, but maybe that's what they want you to think. I mean, if you live with a cat... I'm convinced many of them have been sent to spy on us. For what purpose? We'll never know. I was reading a story as a candidate for today's episode. A story about an island of cats off the coast of Brazil, where about 20 years ago a couple lived on this tiny island some real survivor-inspired stuff, but when they left, they ended up leaving their two cats behind. Well, cats do what cats do. Mostly eat birds and make kittens. So they did okay on this island, but as more and more fishermen and tourists would go by the island and see more and more cats, people started to think in a very unhelpful, terribly human way. They started to abandon their unwanted cats here on the island, too. Fishermen would go by and see more and more cats, tourist boats would go by and people would feed the island of cats and then head home. So people being good humans always seem to help the victims of animals and people who are also horribly mistreated by other humans. Being human is complicated, y'all. Anyway, after COVID-19 started to shut things down in the tourist industry, the cats on this island really started to find themselves in a bad way. Fishermen, when they were finally allowed out on the boats again, discovered the kitty colony was starving. Many of the cats had died, and they weren't looking so good. With humans staying inside and not participating in the tourist industry, the cats had no food, no clean water. And so these fishermen became superheroes. They grabbed volunteers, a boatload of PVC pipe, which are plastic tubes you can interlock in many ways— They're really useful for quick, light builds that are waterproof. And they went to work making rudimentary feeding stations around Cat Island. Long, hollow pipes with a U-bend, almost like a toilet, at the bottom to basically create a self-feeding station. Imagine a long letter J of PVC pipe tied to trees. And the, the J part, the little curly bit, resting on the ground, and the food poured into the top of the J. And as the cats eat from the open, curved bit... The food from the top of the J fills into the bottom, creating a rudimentary self-feeder for the cats. Fishermen go weekly to replenish the food, and they save the cats. Well, now it's still really sad. People will still essentially dump their companions on this island. And the fishermen say that when they get there, they know who's new to the island, as the most recent cats still very much love people. And they try to make friends with the fishermen, which 
is in stark contrast to the feral cats, the ones who were born on this island, who were never raised in a home or near people, who have figured out how to climb trees and eat wildlife, and that humans are scary. So while this might not be the happiest story, this is a case of humans being both the cause and the solution to the kitty's problems. But when I went to look back onto this island of cats, I discovered Brazil isn't the only country with a cat island. In fact, Japan has a listicle called the Top 3 Cat Islands in Japan. Top 3. Meaning, there are more than three cat islands in just Japan. The most famous cat island is Aoshima, home of 15 to 20 humans and about 120 cats, or roughly six cats for every human on the island. This is not a destination island. This is a small remote island that is somebody's home, the home of these humans and these cats. The cats were originally brought in to help with a rat problem on ships, and they either escaped and made a home on the island or were left here after the fishermen departed. But either way, these cats call this place home, and the humans feed and care for all of them. There are no cars, no hotels, no high-end restaurants, but if you're the kind of person who thinks that you would enjoy just chilling on an island with semi-feral cats, and you do not want to talk to people at all, you might have just discovered heaven. Just bring your own snacks and don't bother the people who live here. It's believed by the local people of the second island, Tashirojima, believe that feeding cats will bring wealth and good fortune. And the humans take incredible care of these feral cats, and the cats have become embraced in this island's culture. In between the two villages of this small island is a shrine for cats called Niko Jinja. It is dedicated to the cats who lost their lives on the island from falling rocks. The cats here are so revered, No pet dogs are allowed on the island. Something to keep in mind when interacting with any cat. Some might love attention and affection and petting, but just like humans, cats have their own individual personalities. As a result, not every cat will love attention in this way. Just because they're cute does not give you permission to pet them because you want to. Consent, consent, consent is always a good rule to follow no matter the species. And no cat destination would be complete without mentioning Hemingway's cats. Thanks, Callie. Ernest Hemingway famously wrote that one cat just leads to another, as he, the OG cat daddy, was always surrounded by a clouder of cats. In fact, the Hemingway Home and Museum in the Florida Keys consistently has 40 to 50 cats on site. And the joke is every room is a cat room, so if you're allergic, find another place to stay. The cats rule the roost, and while they are known for their polydactyl paws, meaning a genetic mutation leading to more toes than, quote, normal on each paw, otherwise called mitten kittens, as their feet look like baseball gloves or big mittens when they just stand still, they have another famous feature. These cats are nearly always named after a famous person like Joe DiMaggio, Betty Grable, and Hunter S. Thompson. So when these cats pass away and cross the Rainbow Bridge after death, they are laid to rest behind the home with a little grave marker. So when and if you ever get to go see Hemingway's house and museum, you can honestly say that you visited Tennessee Williams' grave and he's buried in Ernest Hemingway's garden next to Winston Churchill and Marilyn Monroe. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who helped humans, or other famous people buried in Ernest Hemingway's backyard, please send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderbeastpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, author of Considerations for the City Dog, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, the oldest AKC obedience club in the country, and creator of Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from Ripley's.com. 
Continental Floss on Cat Facts, SmithsonianMag.com on the CIA's Trained Spies, History.com, Cool Kid Facts on Newton's Laws of Motion, because I forgot and had to look them up, Smithsonian Mag on Ernest Hemingway and his cats, understandinganimalresearch.org.uk, hopkinsmedicine.org, hisgo.com, and the Mayo Clinic. A very special shout out to my friend Travis Seifman. He's in Japan right now and was able to help me with some of the pronunciation of the islands where the cats live. Thanks, Trav. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music today is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz and interstitial music is by MK2. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. We are now on YouTube, so if your friends don't know what a podcast is, you can just go and search for Bewilderbeast Pod on YouTube. It's not visually exciting, it's just the logo. But the audio is all there, so if that's your jam, go for it. Send it to your grandparents. And again, if you have teachers in your lives who would like for me to come in and have a conversation about cool animals that you've learned about on this podcast, let them know. And they can contact me through the website, bewilderbeastspod.com. As always, thanks for listening, and I will see you next week. Meow.